joining Ron on stage, please welcome Mayor Mitch Landrew. Hey, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good to see you. Good Thanks to see you. Hey, everybody. Wow, thank you for joining us. Great and uh, the, the newly minted Profile and Courage Award, the well, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Yeah, thank you. Your mayor. Thank you. Hey, Jason. Congratulations on thank that. You. Thank you so well, much. Thank, thank you so much for being here uh, with us. Um, let's start with, uh, let's start with the, the more than half full side of the glass, which is that since Katrina, New Orleans has experienced significant economic growth uh, and population growth. I saw that um, the population growth for the entire metro area as of, uh, as of this January is up to, back up to 95% of what it was uh, in 2000, which is a remarkable uh, amount of recovery. What has been the key? What has allowed that to happen? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's thank nice to see you. Thank all of you. Welcome to the Ace Hotel. Uh, my council member at large is with us today, Jason. Thank you. It's nice to see you. And so many of the people that helped, you know, bring New Orleans back from the brink. Um, let me begin on the other side just for a minute mm -hmm. to acknowledge that New Orleans still has a long yeah. way to go. We have still a lot of problems to solve. Uh, and so nothing I say should um, be seen as a contradiction to that, but it is important to start. Don't worry, we'll get to all of that. Yeah, I know. To start where, <laughs> to start where your, your, your panelists left off about the, the way is more important than the people mm. and how we actually got from being a descending city to being an ascending city. So what do I mean when I say that? The night before Katrina hit, the city of New Orleans was losing population. Every indicator, every one, was going in a negative direction. Everyone that you wanted to go up was going down, and everyone you wanted to go down was going up. And after Katrina hit, um, I, I think something miraculous happened. It took a while for the miracle to take shape, mm -hmm. because like any community, we were traumatized. We were stuck. You'll see this in Puerto Rico right now. We didn't really know which way to go. We didn't know how to get our leadership straight. We didn't know how to talk to each other. We were worried that some people were going to take our stuff and other people were going to take credit for what we did. And we went through three or four years of really being stuck. Um, and then we, we began to, to figure out that we were kind of all in this together and that if we didn't band together, we were going to have a problem. And so the city, and I, I think this is the miracle of, of the whole story, we all did together stop the city of New Orleans from falling off of a cliff. People forget this because all of us are oriented into today. But 12 years ago... Um, and actually, a couple of weeks before I took office, during that period of time, we had gone through Katrina, Rita, mm. Ike, Gustav. We got our butts kicked by the National Recession. And then we had the BP oil spill, which not only killed 11 citizens, but basically upended our economy again. So we had three economic tsunamis, one after 9-11. And we had just gotten back right before Katrina. Then we had Katrina. Then we had the BP oil spill. Now, I'm not aware of any other group of folks anywhere in the country that has had to resurrect themselves from that. And so now, when you look at the city, we have brand new schools, brand new learning centers that before Katrina, you would not have wanted your kids to go to. Now we have really some of the finest physical buildings. We're in the midst of reforming our education system, and the indicators there broadly, although there's controversy around this, is that graduation rates are up, dropout rates are down, and the achievement gap is closing. So the kids, my kids, that they said couldn't learn, actually when they're given the right tools and the right teachers and the right incentive are actually doing much, much better than people thought. We've built three new hospitals. We have an entire new medical economy that we didn't have before. We have a bunch of primary health care clinics that have helped kind of create getting to the front side of healthcare right in the back. We're building a new airport. We're building a new riverfront. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on fixing these really broken, terrible streets that we have that have been with us for a long time and continue to deteriorate because the pipes underneath the city are bleeding about 40% of our water. And we are the poster child for when infrastructure is not invested in it when it breaks and what it looks like when you do invest in it and how you create jobs. And the way, we, the, the way we did that, and the way is much more important than the thing, and I completely agree with that young lady that was up here before, it shouldn't be about any one person. When you wrap an organization around one person as opposed to the way of getting things done, as soon as that person leaves, everybody's like, well, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. and, and you've got to build strength into your DNA. And so what happened here that's very different than what I've seen in, in other cities up to this point is because none of us had enough, 
we all found ourselves at the table together. And I, I, I use these words because I can't think of more simple ones to use, but we, we, we really focused on horizontal and vertical integration this way and that way across a number of different sectors, the government sector. So that what that meant was when we were dealing with the federal government, we weren't just dealing with the secretary of department. We wanted the deputy secretary, we wanted the regional director, and we wanted the local director. So there was no lack of communication, for example, in HUD. But the problem was in Washington, they have a lot of stovepipes. And those organizations don't talk to each other. So we asked President Obama to push them together. And Secretary Donovan, before he became the director of OMB, became like the director of making sure the federal government, when they spoke to us, spoke with us with one voice so that we didn't have to run up there and talk to 50 of them. They were all in the room. Then we made sure that the state government was in the room and the local government. And on top of that, did not try to do anything without the faith-based community, without the not-for-profit. So Jim Page, you standing in the back of the room, Habitat for Humanity. You know, and thousands of organizations that do the same kinds of things, but maybe in different iterations. We were all at the same table trying to work on system design. And I like to think that we, we, we had equal opportunity and equal responsibility. And as a consequence, we began then, once we got the way right, to be able to see things coming out of the ground, gave us a little bit more confidence in ourselves, taught us where to direct money and where not to direct money. And we got to be a pretty well-oiled um, group of individuals, all coming from different places that began to achieve what I call the one team, one city fight because we were focused. Now, I have to say that today, we're kind of starting to go back to fighting over the itty bitty things that created, you know, alienation between us. And I think you've got to, you got to fight really hard to not dismiss those concerns as being important, but to stay focused on a common agenda. You, you, you've restored you a baseline of economic growth, of population yeah. growth, uh, but like many cities, you are dealing with sustained inequities, right? Big gaps uh, along racial lines in income, in educational attainment, in wealth. What does it take to go to the next stage and to have a, uh, have a growing economy in which a broader circle of the community it's a great, is benefited? It's a great question. Some things are micro and some things are macro. The macro things are school system, most important thing. At the end of the day, if you can't, if you can't teach and you can't learn, there's, there's almost no way to get to a place of creating a job or getting hired someplace. Entrepreneurship is important. The notion, um, and, and I, I don't want to shy away from this because we, we just announced that DXC technology is coming in. It's one of the biggest job gets that we've gotten, 2,000 high-tech jobs, and it's great. It's going to be really, really great because they're going to hire a lot of people from here, but they're going to bring people from here, and that's one way of economic growth and development. But the other way is to be creative yourself. And so the idea of Villip and this whole notion of entrepreneurship and being a creator of small businesses is critically important too. But all of that rests on having a good education is, is what I would say. Secondly, how the criminal justice system treats its citizens. Now, ours has been particularly bad mm -hmm. over the years. In Louisiana, we incarcerate more people than any place else in the world. And so Jason and I and a whole bunch of other people have spent a lot of time really thinking about how to be tough on crime because there are people out there that are gonna commit crimes. You have to protect, I have to help protect you from them and them from each other and make sure that those people that are gonna to continue to do that, that we, but we ought to know that not everybody and not every crime is the same. And there are a lot of people that are doing things that do not warrant life sentences or 14 year sentences and a prison to pipeline that we have. And we ought to be smart enough to figure out how to be tough and smart. And then finally, um, in, order, in order to deal with the issue of equity, which, which we have confronted directly in the city, Number one, you have to acknowledge that it exists, mm -hmm. not have a debate about whether it exists. It exists. The system is inequitable, and equity is different from equality. Dr. Norman Francis, who's all of our godfather, you know, here always uh, tells us, and everybody's heard his speech before, but if he was here, he'd put two glasses here to, of, of that, you, that contain water, and uh, one would have a lot of water in it, and one would have a little and he'd pour the same amount of water in each grass and the inequity would still mm -hmm. be the same. And so what you wanna do is level that off and you do that by creating opportunity. Now, the first thing we had to do was to confront the fact that it existed. So in our city, with our city council's blessing, we spent a pretty good amount of money on a disparity study so that we can empirically demonstrate to people. Because I believe if you, can't, if you can't count it, you can't manage it. And if you can't see it, you can always deny it. So empirical data is important. And so we did this on housing. She, we, uh, our housing folks are here. We did this on disparity studies so that people who are in business can see, here, Mr. CEO, let me show you where the inequity is and let me show you why you're losing. 
So we developed something. So we, we, yeah. we, we tried to see what we could see and know what we can know. And then once we did that, we said, well, how do, what is the specific strategy, not the theoretical strategy for changing it? So now that we know that 38,600 African-American men are not working in the city, what is the specific plan for those specific individuals? And so we had to create what we called an anchor strategy. So I called in all the CEOs of all the major companies and said, look, here's the deal. You are an anchor institution. In other words, you're supposed to be anchoring a neighborhood. You have all these people coming from outside of the city working well, in your neighborhood, and all the people living in the shadow of your building are not. So here's my, here's my theory. When the sun's at 12 o'clock and it casts a shadow on your building, wherever that shadow casts, everybody that lives in that shadow should be working in your building. So why don't we think about figuring out who those individuals are, creating worker training programs, and then making sure that the people of New Orleans rebuild New Orleans. And we've been working on that now for a good five or six years with some, with some good promising progress And there. as you know from your work with the Conference of Mayors, this is not a unique problem to New Orleans. When, when, John Hickenlooper, when John Hickenlooper was the mayor of Denver, he called this the Denver paradox. He said on the one hand, the economy and the quality of life is such that we're attracting educated, talented young people from all over the country and all over the world to come live here. And yet we can't put our own kids right. from low-income neighborhoods on a track to compete for the jobs that we are creating. And we hear that in Austin, in Seattle. We've been all over uh, on the, with this project. And we hear from mayors over and over right. again. Um, one answer that people have looked at is expanding basically the educational ladder. You have more cities trying to invest in pre-K and even in some cases post high school funding two years of post-secondary. Is that realistic for cities to take on that burden to create a longer <laughs> educational uh, track for people? Well, you, you, just, you asked the question about the what and then you asked the question yeah. about the how. Yeah, right. And those are two different things mm -hmm. and you have to be clear about them. Nobody in here should, should be confused about what's happening, which is that Washington is stuck, all right? It's getting, it's getting more stuck, not less stuck. It's providing less leadership and less resources. And the consequence of that, and this has been happening for the past 30 years across Democratic and Republican administrations, although the Republicans are much more hostile and intentional about it, um, is they are, they are pushing responsibility to do things and to pay for things down to the ground. Let me just give you one example, mental health, which of course we all are dealing with as it relates to public safety and guns and all kinds of stuff. Mental health has always been in the purview of the federal government, but they quit funding mental health a long time ago. The consequence, City of New Orleans, the consequence, the City of New Orleans right now is under federal consent decree from the same Justice Department of the same executive branch that won't fund mental health because we don't provide mental health in our prisons, which is not where mental health is supposed to be provided. They're supposed to be on the other side of the prison gate. But they're holding us, they're, hold, they're holding us accountable and they're punishing us because they can do it through a federal court and take our money Federal judge can tell Jason, who's the head of uh, the city council right now, that I want you to take money from NARD and I want you to give it to mental health behind the jail door because we can. Now, a federal judge is, doesn't, is not really a yeah. council member. They don't go to hearings, but they can do that. And so one of the things that cities have been saying back to Washington is, look, we're not asking you to do our work for us. We're asking you to do your work so that we don't have to do your work for you. You guys are like deadbeat dads now. Right? Y'all have, have all kinds of obligations. And so what is happening? And this is happening across education, health care, whatever it is. The federal government is pushing all of those responsibilities down to the ground. The states, which are not managing their budgets as well as ours. Jason and I managed our budget. Eight years in a row, balanced budget. We got money in the bank. Highest credit rating that the city has ever had. Okay? That's how we manage our budget. State of Louisiana is suffering a $2 billion deficit. They can't make ends meet. They just had a special session that failed. Congress has the largest debt and the largest deficit that it ever had. So you can imagine how mayors and council members feel when, the, when Washington doesn't show up and they say, oh, you fixed the problem. So now let me get to your yeah. specific answer to your question. <laughs> we need, we need, we know the answer. Brain development, zero to three, critically important for every child in America. That's where the game is, zero to three. But the question is, where is the money to do that? Who's supposed to pay mm. for it? What happens on zero to three and then early childhood education? We took the first step, really against my better judgment. Jason and them wanted to fund early childhood. I said, don't do that. 
And they said, why? It's important. I said, it's critically important. It's a major priority. But you see, that's not our budget item. That's supposed to be the state, and that's supposed to be mm -hmm. Congress. And Jason never said, well, thanks, Mr. Mayor, for your advice, but we're going to ignore it because we can't wait. And you know what? They were probably right about that. But now what's going to happen is this is going to happen. You can see this coming from a mile away. You don't have to guess about this. Cities that have money and that have tax bases are going to outpace cities that well, don't. Right, so cities a, that are poorer yeah. right now are going, to be, are, are going to be stressed, and then the income divide is going to ex get exacerbated just like the rural-urban divide is, and that's not going to be good for the country So the fact that a Seattle or a Denver or some of the more affluent cities are doing the pre-K, it's well, not something you think can, can on a mass basis be, uh, uh, be absorbed by cities as it, opposed to bigger governmental levels. Somebody, here's where mayors, mayors have to be fiscally responsible. You can't have something for nothing. Somebody's got to pay for it. Nothing's free. Uh, and, and, and those are the, those are the things that, that, that guide what I do as the mayor. So there may be some things that I think are absolutely imperative that are right, but that we can't afford. And I have a bunch of legislators mm. who are from New Orleans, by the way, that insist on letting the legislature tell the city of New Orleans what to do. This is not unlike a red state telling a blue city what to do or a blue state telling a red city what to do. The legislature can't even balance its budget, and they're imposing, you know, restrictions on us. But let me just tell you what that is. When they impose a mandate on us for somebody to pay, it's a tax increase for a working class person in New Orleans that's already stressed. And that's something that I just push back on really hard. Now, that's a little different from do we need to do that thing as opposed to whose responsibility it is to pay for it. And my council members have been breaking their backs to say, we can't wait anymore. We have to go do this. But it is going to cause a lot of challenges in years to come as we try to manage our way out of the system, maintain the stability that we have, and invest in the future where it needs. But I would just say this, early childhood education, universal pre-K, you wanna fight crime, anchor strategies for economic development, all of these things are tied into making the streets of New Orleans safer. Your new book, um, which is out, what, this week, is it? In the Shadow of Monuments? In the Shadow of Statues. The Shadow of Statues. V riveting personal and political memoir, a terrific description of all of the, uh, which we'll come to in a minute, of, of, of the uh, recounting of the fight the battle, which I think, as you say, surprised you in its ferocity. Yeah, ultimately, that was a naive before we get to that, before we get to that, though, let me ask you: <laughs> You describe the massive charter school experiment in New Orleans. "Quote: You say it has been an unparalleled success. Why do you feel that way? Well, it's, that's a very controversial statement. It, yes, <laughs> but I want, but I want, <laughs> but I want people, I want people to remember what it was like before. If you were not in this city before, how many educators do we have that are in the city that were here before? Mm. You remember, they, you, Bill Capo, y'all know who Bill Capo is? Bill Capo is the pothole guy. <laughs> before he was on me about potholes, you know, every day going out and say, oh, there's a pothole, Mayor, please come fix it, even though mm. hundreds of thousands of them. What Bill Capo used to do is take his camera every day and go into schools. And the walls were broken, the plaster was broken, the bathrooms were broken, the kids didn't have anywhere to wash their hands. It was awful. And by measures that were objective, I don't know, 67 to 70% of the schools were failing, which meant our kids had no Ooh. chance. And so in comes really Governor Blanco, who was a Democratic governor, along with Mary, Senator Landrieu, and they said, we got to find a new egg. And uh, we started thinking about this charter model. Now, what we found out quickly was that that was a lightning ride. That the lightning ride used to be about vouchers. Then it was a, a fight between vouchers and public schools. And then there are things he's called public charter schools. And I think what we learned, what I think I learned, and, and I hope I learned it correctly, is that the nature of the school, public, private, or voucher, or private Catholic, didn't matter as much as what was actually happening in the building. And I think we learned that in any one of those schools, in any one of those governing models, that if there was a strong principal that had the freedom to hire great teachers based on what the teachers knew and not who they were related to on the school board, and that they weren't worried about who was getting a toilet paper contract, or they weren't stuck on the employer-employee relationships, that kind of principal with that kind of team, with some kind of parental or grandparent or aunt or uncle involvement in some form or fashion, and they had high standards, and they had some kind of accountability measures that were actually good accounting measures because they're not all mm. equal. In that instance, what you saw was kids' performances getting better. And what we were concerned about was the dropout rate uh, and, of course, the suspension rate. So I thought that the numbers reflected 
that the schools and the kids are doing much better. When you go into schools now, if you're a politician and you got good sense and you walk into a school, mostly if you look into a child's eyes, you can tell right away whether the light's off or whether the light's on. Let me, let me ask you, though, because the graduation rate is much higher than it was before Katrina, but it has peaked and has been moving well, back it, it, down it, it, in the last several years. What's happened? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. No, but I mean, that's like saying, God, you did great, and now you're mm. kind of going back. It's terrible. No, you did great, and you're sliding back. Let's figure what that is and make it go back again. I don't think we know. Again, I, I, I'm a, a, a mm. data junkie. Right. And I think that we ought to do a deep dive on this before we decide that we're going in the wrong direction. I mean, we, first of all, we have a long way to go. I think the number, uh, uh, my numbers are off a little bit, but I think the number of failing schools that we have in the city has dramatically declined. Somebody in here knows the number now, but it's in the low 20s and maybe even lower than that. And so uh, I do think there are some concerns. There's some, a couple of things that are going on in the schools that we have to really fix, which is, well, they're not neighborhood-based anymore and kids are stressed because they have to travel so far. Busing, and then how we handle special ed kids, right? And we don't do that well. We don't actually do that well anywhere in America where we have, handle our special needs kids. And I think that's pretty universally true. It is also true that in most of our educational systems in, across America, we're not really that good. They, that we all need to be better and we're not really keeping up, especially in math and science, uh, art, uh, all of the STEM stuff. And some of that was because of the, the uh, low expectations. But I can tell you this, all of our kids that are in STEM now or in STEAM, that Dr. Mackey is running for us in the Nord programs, these kids are blowing it off the charts. And I just know, I know this, I'll fight anybody in the country on this, not Biden. I don't want to fight, yeah, yeah. beat me up. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean fight like that. I'm going to let Trump and Biden do that. But, but I, would, I, would, I would battle on behalf of the kids in New Orleans who I think are as smart and as fast as anybody in America. And we've had a lot of people telling us that we're just not smart, and that's just not true. Let me ask you about a couple other areas in, in, in the time we have left. In, in your work in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, you have been touring some of the cities that have been hardest hit by natural disasters. Yeah. Uh, you've been in Miami, you've been in Houston, you've been in Key West, obviously. Puerto Rico. At Puerto Rico. New Orleans, you know, from Katrina, is right at the top of that list. As the climate continues to change, are we going to be able to save all of the coastal cities mm. where people now live? And it, if so, what will it take to do that? Why you want to ask that? me that question yeah. all my people? Yeah, I mean, can we? Well, can I, t can I, can I quote the Dalai Lama? You can quote the Dalai Lama, yeah. I don't think there, I don't the think he's, I don't, I'm not sure this. he's that near a coast, this. right? The Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama said be a little less I coastal. I did not say this, and I don't other. adopt this theory, but we were all in distress, obviously in great anxiety about our city. And the Dalai Lama came to visit us, which was a great blessing. John Lewis was with him. Mm. And some brilliant person in the audience said, what advice do you have for us that live in this low-lying area? He says, well, if you, if you live low and it's wet, go high. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were like, no, no, that wasn't the answer that we wanted. Yeah. But let me, let me, let me, let me again try to, be, try to be forthright about this. First of all, climate change is real. And it is, it is, is, is contributed to it uh, mostly by human action. And unless we reverse that, we can expect the same things that are occurring to occur, which means the sea level's rising. I mean, this is like first grade stuff. But, but New Orleans has more problems than just climate change. We have a, a couple of different things going on. We have subsidence because we live on soft stuff and it keeps going down. Um, and the other thing we have is the oil and gas industry, which helps provide a lot of the you know, fuel for the rest of the country. And the oil and gas companies have cut you know, slices in the marsh. And because we are protecting the rest of the country by imports and exports along the Mississippi and have levied the Mississippi, and those levies hopefully will never break, the sediment is not going back into the marsh and replenishing the marsh. What is the consequence? Consequence is the land is going away. And right now, I don't know what the metric is. It used to be 100 yards every 40 minutes, but I think that that's exacerbating and it's going quicker. This is not a guess. This is a, this is a mathematical calculation. If we don't do anything, and those, those forces continue to operate, the city of New Orleans, as you know it, will have water lapping up against its levees by the end of this century. That's kind of the way it's gonna work. And so we have to think about how to build smartly and differently. Now, whether people should be relocated or not is a different issue. Right now, we're actually locating an American Indian community from in the lower uh, coastal parishes, but they're only going up to Homa. That's not that far. I mean, you may see, there, there was an article that was a little bit interesting but scary. I didn't really believe it, but then I didn't know enough not to believe it, that said that Austin and Baton Rouge, you know, will be the line 
in 100 years. Mm. So, I mean, that's a lot for us to think about. So we have a couple of different options. We can spend a lot of money getting smarter, pushing off the water. We can concede the fight and move to higher ground. All we can just really do really smart things now and prepare ourselves for what we know is coming our way. It should not be a surprise to us, anybody in here, that we're going to get hit by another hurricane. Like, that's going to happen. Can I predict that for you? Yeah. So there, there are parts of so coastal, get ready for it. There are parts of coastal cities that you think may not be able to be defended. I, 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 think, they, I think that you can't. I think people hate to hear that. I don't know exactly yeah. where they are. But the other thing, too, is around the United States of America, you know, 85% of the people, I think, live in areas that are subject to the coast. We just get bent yeah. out of shape here when people say we're ignorant people <clears throat> because we live where we live. When cities like Miami and New York City mm-hmm. are much more vulnerable than we are. Yeah. I mean, we didn't beat the people up in New York because Sandy hit them and said it's because mm-hmm. they drink too many hurricanes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do that. We loved them, and we wanted to help them. As a matter yeah. of fact, we went up there to help them. The bigger point of this is that the whole nation is involved in this, and we are all at risk. And we have to think about where we build and how we build and when we build back, build back in sustainable ways. And then finally, this idea that you can live against the water. I think the Dutch have taught us that it's smarter to try to live with the water. So maybe instead Ooh. of building levees alone, you build dikes and dams and you give places for the water to go. You have permeable pavement. There are lots of other smart things that we could do. And in the meantime, we should do what we can do to reduce the number of emissions that all of us help create while simultaneously try to keep the economy going. Now, I know some people think this is a zero-sum game. I don't necessarily see it that way. But if we're going to transition to new kinds of fuel, this is what we don't want to do. Just cut people off and say there's no way for you to feed your family tomorrow, we have to have some kind of transition from where we are to where we're being. And the city right now is dealing with that issue with the new power plant that just got uh, greenlit by the city council about how that may not be the perfect thing, but it's better than what we have right now. And unless you can show me something on how we can transition to that, help me get from here to there. Because when you don't have a plan to get from here to there, the people that are in those jobs now look at you and say, you don't see me and you can't hear me. And so I want to go vote for somebody that I shouldn't have voted for that's causing us problems. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have anybody in mind with no, that. No, I don't. No. I'm just saying. Right. Just let me, um, let, let, let's, let's do, I know the mayor is pretty Anger hard, and frustration. hard timeline, but let's do a quick question here, if we have Anybody? one. Anybody? Yeah. One. Yes. Hi, Jim. Hey, Mitch. One of the issues you talked about a little bit was mental health. You know, following Katrina for a year or two, we talked a lot about mental health. We talked about PTSD. Our prisons are filled yeah. with people who yeah. are mentally ill. We've got kids who have experienced years of trauma who, you know, a 20-year-old today was eight years old then. I understand what you're saying about the Republican federal government and how much money are we really going to see for mental health. But I really think it's one of the bigger issues that we as a community have got to try to wrap our arms around. I'm not saying we're not all trying Mm. to, but I think the only time we talk about mental health in our country is when someone gets hurt or killed. Right. Well, I didn't limit my criticism to Washington and the Republican. I'm talking about all of them. I mean, Washington is like, that's not our problem until there's a major problem. And then they're on the street saying this is a federal issue. Yeah. So every time there's a shooting, you know, the senators and the congressmen show up and then we say, well, we need money to help. They go, oh, that's local. That's not federal. And so all of this is all of this is all of us. And the way it works best, put an ideology aside, is when the federal government shows up when and where it's supposed to. And the state shows up and locals, if someone doesn't show up, somebody else has to do somebody else's job. And I think one of the great, uh, I, I actually missed this after Katrina, was, was the, the mental and psychological devastation and how upended we all felt after um, Katrina. If you haven't gone through this, this is really, it's, it may be hard for me to explain, but most of us get up every day and we assume the earth is going to be under us and that your doctor's office is going to be there and your school is going to be there. And when it's gone, it really kind of freaks you out. You know, and you get back because you have to be strong, but it has, a, it has an unnerving consequence that lasts for a long time. And I think, I know I miss this with my kids because my kids, we were all together and we were there. But you know, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, for example, lost her entire senior year. And I don't think I fully appreciated <clears throat> the impact that that had on her with not being with her friends and her social network. And I think... Now, as, as Jim said, these kids that were eight are now 18, and some of them are acting out, and we're trying to figure out why. So on the issue, and we see this, of course, it's playing out across America, across all classes and races on opioid addiction. And uh, interestingly enough, I'm listening to Washington, and I'm thankful that they just put $4 billion up, which is a drop in the bucket Ooh. for what we need, but I'm thankful that they took a good step. 
But let me give you a good example of how you can, you can uh, rob Peter to pay Paul or, or hide, you know, the, 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 the thing, the nut under the walnut when they're moving it around. In order to fight opioid addiction, if you listen to the experts, they say you need prevention and then you need treatment, right? Those are two things that are important. You also need Narcan when somebody, mm. you know, is in the worst mm. set of circumstances and you need a whole bunch of other stuff. But just on those two things. So Congress says, we're coming to the rescue on opioid. We're going to put some money up. But simultaneously, though, in the tax bill and in their assault on Obamacare, yeah. they took away the funding for the two things that you need actually to provide the treatment. So let me be, give you an example. Odyssey House, which is one of our great providers that does just heroic work, and they're saints. They are just right now trying to open up a treatment facility on Broad Street in New Orleans, which is less than two minutes from here. It's an old car dealership. And they needed the money to renovate the property. Well, the federal historic tax credit is the financial tool that they are using, but Congress took away that historic tax credit, so the investments in buildings and the ability to do it goes away. So that's part A. Part B, most of the people that they're treating right now are being treated because of Medicaid expansion. Yep. And if you didn't have Medicaid expansion, you can't do it. So all of a sudden, here comes $4 billion from the top. Superman's coming in. But on the bottom, Robin's taking the wheels off of the car. Mm. Batman. I should have said Batman's yeah. coming in and Robin. Y'all know what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm a little old. Um, I've been watching the Black Panther, so... <laughs> so I'm a little off on my, on my but you, so when, what happens is when people say I'm going to solve the problem and you say when you give me one thing and you take away another you stay even where you are so if they want to take a holistic approach to this a nine ideologic approach what they want to do is use data figure out what the strategy is fund the strategy measure its success and then figure out whether or not you want to keep going. I, I know you've got to go do your day job. I but, do. But let me ask you real quickly. You write, I have to go kick off the jazz fest. I mean, y'all want me to do yeah. that, right? You write... You do want me to do that, yeah. don't you? You all write right. very eloquently in the book Thank about you. the struggle over the statues. As we've been talking about all morning, the country is going through... Well, it's a discussion about race. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to say, the, the country is going through an historic demographic trans transformation. Yeah. And as we can see... Not everybody's happy about but it. But not our and first And there's a lot one. of tension about it. But not our first one. Not our first one. This is not the first time. I mean, so when the talk Italians... Talk about what you learned in that experience that might be relevant to helping it's just the not, country get this through is not. It's first of all, it's, it's the hardest thing that we ever do is talk about race in America. And everybody knows that by 2040, um, we're going to have a new majority, as though somehow that's like a zero-sum game. I mean, the whole point throughout the entire history of America as that we are, we are a nation where our diversity has been our strength. And this is nothing new. This is why this is so surprising. I mean, back in the day, people didn't like Italians, and they didn't like the Irish, and they didn't like the Catholics, which I happen to be one of them. And all of a sudden now, things are changing, and people are feeling upended, but it's going to be okay. And the reason you know it's okay, this is where New Orleans shines. I mean, we're really good at this. We're really getting along pretty well. I mean, in this city, notwithstanding the upset about the monuments, most of those people were from, not from the city. They didn't live in the city, and they acted like they could do what they wanted with the property in the city when the people of New Orleans wanted to do something different. So in its essence, this was really just a property dispute. It really, in its essence, when you strip it all away, should you have a right to do with the property that you own? Now, for people that are really conservative, they should understand that because they spent a lot of time making sure the Constitution protected private property rights, except when people wanted to do something with their own property that you didn't like. So that's like first. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is, and I feel more strongly about this today than when I started this, is that when you have vestiges of racism, and that is what those statues were, those statues were not put up to, to revere those individuals. They were put up to send a message to the African-American community. These are not my words. These are their words. These are their words, all right? And I just think in the 21st century, we ought to be able to state really clearly in this country that the Civil War was about destroying the United States of America for the cause of preserving slavery, and that the Confederacy was on the wrong side of humanity. I can certainly understand people saying to me, how can I have a conversation with you about reconciliation if you can't acknowledge that simple historical fact? And then now that you do that, now let's talk about all the other things that we need to work on together, because essentially... And this is what I wanted to say about Dr. Francis and my daddy. They were two little boys, 19 years old in school. They were friends. And when I asked my dad, who, who voted against the segregation package and got death threats when he was 29, had four kids at home, was scared to death, I said, you know, why did you fight so hard for Norman? 
and Blanche and all of their kids who were all smarter and faster and better than Moon and all of his kids. Why did you fight for them? He said, I wasn't fighting for Norman. I said, really? He goes, I was fighting for me. And I said, well, explain that to me. He said, Norman made me better. He said, and when the world made it impossible for us to be together, he goes, we were less. And he said, so yeah, I was fighting for Norman figuratively and generally, but it was just as much about all of us. And I would just say this, New Orleans, if we don't do anything else well, we demonstrate to the rest of the world how beautiful diversity is and how much better we are because out of many, we are one. That's what we are. And I'll, I'll argue with anybody in the country about that. And that's what the book is about. All right, I got to go. Mr. Mayor, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Good see to see you. you. All right.